Welcome to Weekends with Whitney. You know you're going to pass a good time in South Louisiana when the host arrives in a helicopter and his guests get to take a ride too. That's just a fraction of the fun at an all are welcome birthday bash. Whoa! <laughs> Long as we explore the party together. Then Dr. Nick shows us easy ways we can all be more likable. If I'm an emotional roller coaster, or if you never know when, when I'm going to drop the bomb and be in a bad mood, that's not very likable. But first, Join us for an extravagant celebration that involves Grammy-winning and world-renowned musicians, along with stars all the way from Broadway to the silver screen. to make an entrance. Part of a three-day weekend celebration in Holden. Bo's extravaganza had something for everyone, especially music lovers. Nearly two dozen artists filled the air with music, including Grammy winners, like Louisiana's own Joel Saunier. He says part of the magic is John Schneider arranged for up-and-comers to know and work alongside veterans. And he's given them a platform so that way they can, you know, express themselves. Whether you're a songwriter, you know, whether it's a band, you know, that kind of deal. You know, he just wants the real deal. And, and uh, he allowed me to, <laughs> to definitely be Joel Sonia. I mean, that's it. I mean, but it's, it's all good. The two share the hit song, I've been around enough to know. Joel recorded it in the mid 70s. He sang it in English and French. <laughs> 10 years later, John Schneider recorded it and took it all the way to number one. The two first met later in Nashville. But humbly, he came up to me and said, if I would have known how to sing French, I would have done the French. Then, because he really respected my record as well. And I knew right then, that's culture. That's, that's, that's right there. That's coming from, you know, from one to another. They reconnected a few years ago at Evangeline Downs when both were now living in Louisiana. I hadn't seen him in, in years, and when I did the event, and he came over and introduced himself, you know, with Alicia, and, and next thing I know, I was doing, I've been up to know on stage, and he came on stage and sang with me, we did I've been up to know together. He did the second part, that kind of deal, it was magic, and we became just good friends. Good friends is the unifying factor here, each having a personal, often funny story that brought their lives together. Byron Cherry and John met as teenagers living in Atlanta. They had the same talent agent as they were breaking into acting. We used to audition for things as brothers. Yeah, so Byron would be the person that I, I hung around with and had a ball, and he was crazy. He would do things like leapfrog, I do not recommend this, <laughs> leapfrogging over parking meters. <laughs> Wow, he can do that? He can, and, and you know. <laughs> oh, good. And it, yeah, well, because if you try that and you miss, bad. 
<laughs> Byron also leapfrogged over John in auditions. We would just shake her hand and go, because I literally would nail the job. I'd always get the job. But he'll tell you. If you ask him that question, no kidding, who got you more got jobs? The jo you he'd did? go, Byron Cherry. He'll go, oh, yeah. And, and Why was that? I just, because I was so talented. No, <laughs> <laughs> of course, silly me. Then the role of a lifetime was up for grabs. Bo Duke. I promise you, you could ask John the same thing. Snyder wasn't up for the part. There was five guys who were looking at Atlanta, Georgia, and I was one of them. John wasn't. Byron's agent said he was a shoe in for the role. Just days later, to everyone's surprise, including John's, it was John flying to Hollywood for a screen test. <laughs> what? No, I just, it was just, it's just the way things work out. And I'm like, he did, he, you, how did you do that? So he ended up crashing the audition. He came in with a six pack of beer, threw it on the table, and walks in, you know, you know, Biggie and goes, Hi, I'm Bo Duke. And, you know, just did his whole routine, went right into his, uh, I probably had, a, like me, a two or three page script, and he went right into character. You know, didn't shave, kind of like me, you know, and torn up t-shirt, and old jeans and boots, and nailed it. The next thing I know, um, I am watching him on Friday night. So I'm going, he made it! But I was so happy for him, I was so proud of him. That's how it happened. Then, four years later, in a merchandising dispute between the show and Schneider, Byron's agent came calling. My phone rings. Hey, Byron, Linda, and beautiful Linda. I miss you, Linda. No, <laughs> she goes. Hey, they're, they're recasting Dukes of Hazzard. You want to you want to audition? I went. Heck yeah! I'm, where do I go? What do I do? I showed up and did a screen mm -hmm. test, three page scene, supposed to be with Daisy Duke. Unfortunately, the guy with the camera guy was a guy, and he had to play Daisy. The scene was. I hear this little squeaky, squirrely little voice. He's trying to be Daisy, and he's a big macho guy, you know? And he's like, oh, okay, bye. I mean, Coy, Coy, you need to want to go to the board's nest. I'm like, my God. He was throwing me off. It was the worst audition of my life. So I walked out crying, just like, there's no way I'm getting that show or being on that. Eventually, he would. Never meaning no harm. My audition lasted a month, three weeks to a month. Yeah, you know, that's I didn't a long understand audition. why. Why? They just kept because they couldn't find the the vans, the cousin. We basically just took, as everybody knows, took over the show. Um, when it said Bo and Luke, they went slash their name out and put uh, Coy and Vance, and we basically the same dialogue they would have had if we, whether you know they're on the show or we're on the show. But the ride was short-lived. We were only on Dukes at the same time for a uh, heartbeat, for like mm. one, one scene. Byron came in and was coy Vance when Tom and I uh, <laughs> did not come back for 18 shows. I'm not going to say we left because we didn't. We just didn't come back. There's a difference. If you don't realize that, get married. <laughs> There's a difference between leaving and not coming home. When we came to the show, they did Welcome Back, Bo and Luke. So they have us, they welcome them back, and by the first commercial, it's bye-bye, Coy and Vance. <laughs> Exit. Uh, Coy and Vance, you go that way. Another high school friend of John's, Jack Gill, was in charge of one of the biggest events of the weekend, John's first big jump in the General Lee. They, too, worked together on the Dukes of Hazard. We're the best stunt guys in the world on Dukes of Hazard. Yeah. Um, and they've all gone on to, like Jack does uh, the Fast and Furious. He's been the coordinator on Fast and Furious for the last mm -hmm. four or five of those movies. So he's amazing. Um, John Cade is here this weekend. He, was, he jumped the General Lee more than anybody. On the set, John witnessed the broken bones and pain the two suffered throughout the years. But he was determined to do it. He wanted to jump the general over the swamp at last year's first extravaganza, but rain reduced it to jumping some kegs of beer. And you see what they've encountered, and you're still going to do I'm still going to do the jump. Yeah, no matter what, I'm going to do the jump. Because? Uh, we just brought in a load of, uh, of uh, gravel okay. so that I can get traction, so I can get 41 miles an hour. It's all I need to do, 41 miles an hour, okay. so I can hit that ramp. But now, because we're doing it to make sure the audience is safe, I'm doing it on the other side of the ravine, which means if something happens to the steering when I land, chances are it will go into the gully, which will turn the car over in the ditch. Ooh. And I'm okay with that. And I'm sure John Cade is okay with that. 
<laughs> well, there's some water in there now, but it's not enough water to be okay. a problem. But yeah, I used to say that friends don't let friends over 40 jump cars. Mm -hmm. And now I'm <laughs> over 40. Finally, over 40. <laughs> and I'm going to jump the car for the first time. But I trust Jack completely. Saturday, it was showtime. John doesn't know it yet. Oh God, it's gorgeous. But the General Lee he's been admiring. Love it, love it. That took two and a half years to build. <laughs> it's about to be his. It's spelled out inside the trunk. Happy birthday, dear John. <laughs> Happy birthday to you. I've had an amazing life, but the best part of my life has been the last four years and change. And, uh, the perfect present from his girlfriend, Alicia. He can hardly believe it. So thank you. Thank you for the greatest birthday present ever. All right. Time to crank it. What in the world did I do? Without you. Thank you, Mr. Whoa, don't get behind me. I'm telling you, this thing is it's goosey. Oh, geez, I can tell. Um, What's the horsepower on this damn thing? Have dynoed it, but this I'm is say great. 550 ish. <laughs> 550. Guess got to take a different ride in a helicopter with Hollywood stunt pilots. It was awesome. Kim can vouch for that. They landed up and rode it down. They were more than drugstore cowboys. They been butt and bruised and kicked around. They took their pain, their voices rang. Others showed off their hood sliding skills. <laughs> then rolled in Kid Rock, who rocked the house.
including fans from as far away as Australia, or John's friends for 50 years. It was a fantastic, unforgettable weekend. They're already planning the third annual celebration for next year. If you'd like tickets, look for them for sale right after the new year. And still ahead, Dr. Nick shows us easy ways we can all be more likable as Weekends with Whitney continues. Louisiana's Old State Capitol educates the public on Louisiana's rich history and the democratic process through exhibits, programming, and the arts. The museum is dedicated to advancing the collection and preserving this national historic landmark. Visit LouisianaOldStateCapitol.org. Breck Summer Camps, where an adventure awaits every child. Where I became a star. Where I made my first shot. Where I crushed the waves. Where I met my wild friends. Where I learned to play. Where I scored the winning point. So break out of the house and experience a new adventure at Breck's Summer Camps. Is likability something that people are just born with? Is it for the gregarious, the beautiful, the powerful? You would be surprised. Dr. Nick joins us <laughs> this morning with more. Some and, interesting research. Yes. It came out on what, what makes someone likable. Yeah, well, and that we're in control of it. We're in control and of I, it. And I found that surprising. We are in control of it. And, and what I also thought was neat about, before we get into it, it's, it's really all about emotional intelligence. Emotional intelligence. And, and it will open it up once we start talking about some of the of likability or actually unlikability. Right. It's what makes you unlikable that uh, we're talking about. We are. And I, I found it interesting. The first one. The first one. On this list is uh, bragging, but they used another word. I mean, it was some type of bragging. Um, you mean the humble bragging? Oh, that's it. That's the it. Humble the humble bragging, bragging. Like, oh, look, look, look at me. I just, oh, this diet and exercise is just killing me. When they're really wanting you to see how beautiful they look. <laughs> it's, it's playing false humility is basically what it. That's an un so so to be likable, you don't. You don't throw out false humility. Say, you know, I feel really good about myself. The diet's hard, but I'm doing better. And self-deprecation can be funny sometimes, but when it's a crutch to get compliments, people see right through it. They see right through it. So you see where it, it, it begins to come in. And again, we're, now we're talking about mo emotional intelligence because that's a life skill. Life, just like name dropping is one oh, that right. will make you unlikable. Oh, people people so just simply are not attracted to people who name drop all the time. And I, I'll tell you where I have to be careful with that. Tell me. Personally, I've had the privilege of traveling. Mm. And I am always very sensitive 
about saying when I talk about it. Look, I'm not, I really am not name dropping. I'm just saying how much I've been privileged and how it has kept me from being closed minded. People who are closed minded, I'm telling you, I'm not attracted to them. No, me either. I, I won't judge, but I can pick up when somebody's just not open-minded. I can spend it, three minutes like, with them like, and I'm done. It's like it's so narrow. I'm like, wow. And I will always kind of want to say, have you not traveled enough? Do you not realize that the, the world is much bigger and that there are many other perspectives? Do you not read what, a newspaper or perhaps more than one? More than one. Or, 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 more, or look at news, more than one news channel. News channel. It's, that's a real problem. We get very closed. Right. You know, and, and so what we, what we, it, it's, it's almost like, you're, you said it to me. The, oh, uh, yeah, tell me but, your quote. I okay, loved it. It's so we great. look for. Well, we must all ask ourselves when, as we're watching the news, as we're reading the newspaper, if we're only stuck to one channel, if we're only stuck to one newspaper, are we looking for information Asian or confirmation? confirmation? I just think that is a meditation for, for life. Because if I'm looking for confirmation, I'm closed. I, right. I'm closed. I'm not growing. I'm closed. I'm not, I'm not stretching myself. Yeah. I'm not stretching myself. And really, that's the only way that we can all come up with our own um, ideas uh, about how things are, how they should be, is it, to sample, really. I mean, hear this and hear that, and then yes. make up your own mind, yes. because nobody should be telling yes. you how to think. It's America. Yes. yes. Yeah. Because open-mindedness means due diligence. Well, there were a few others that jumped out real quick. One was don't, don't get too close too quick don't don't tell too much too quick oh right which i really thought was important it's almost emotional dumping right cut, but that's i, I had that problem <laughs> I, i'm telling you people will come in and i'm saying look i don't have time to get to know you can we go to work and i'm thinking <laughs> sometimes maybe a little bit more rapport might be good but you know but, you're, it, it, but you but, tell me but 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 i do what i do and I, i'm all into this segment you can tell that you know what i think works what what i'm curious what was one of the likability factors Ask Asking questions. questions. Be curious about other people. Right. Tell, tell me this, tell me that, tell me that, tell me that. Questions are really very good. We used to say that's terrible therapy by asking questions. They're, asking questions are wonderful. Yeah, but you, can I, if I, I hope sure. I'm not, um, I'm, I'm, I, don't, I'm, I don't think I'm telling a secret of yours, but we were talking about this and, and sharing too much, you know, is one of those Sharing things. too much, and you yes. Say, and you said that in, in relationships, in romantic relationships, you think that's one of your problems. Yes, yes. I, when I like someone, I've always kind of like, oh, this is great, this is it. Well, it ain't it. <laughs> and you just, you, you think you spew It ain't much. it. Because <laughs> then, then some other things begin to come out, and it's like, whoa. whoa it's why, heavy now. Why, why did I become that close too quickly? Yeah. And it's because You're you terrible want to share. To I, am not, I am very professional. I'm so sorry. <laughs> but but I, I think we're all guilty of that in relationships. Whitney. You, know, you a, like somebody a lot, and then you don't realize that maybe it's. It's very powerful. Yeah. It's very powerful. All all of these factors of likability are powerful. One of the other ones, gossip. Oh, and, you dreadful. know, what, if I sat here and I heard you gossip about people for, for 30 minutes, don't you think that I'm going to say, Whitney, what do you say about me, baby? You're exactly right. What do you right. say about me when, when I'm, I'm not, not around? Here. I just am not, gossip is just not a turn on. And oh, when, when I will sometimes fall into it, I want to say, t please tell me. I'm not. I'm not a gossiper. I've never. I don't want to be a gossiper. You've never been. You know, I don't. I just don't. I don't like it. Mm -mm. I don't mm -mm. like it, and that's another reason why I'm careful not to try to follow sensationalism, because right. it can be just gossip. Right. And uh, emotional uh, hijacking. <laughs> now that blew me away. I, I didn't the phrase even, itself. I didn't even quite understand it. So let's open that up real quick. Okay. They said it, they were explaining emotional hijacking as explosiveness and anger and venting and screaming and, and hollering. And I was thinking, hmm, I don't know that I'd call it hijacking, but I know exactly what they're saying. And what they're saying, I believe, is we, oh, one of the greatest life skills is to have self-regulation. I can keep my temperature at 98.6, ah, my mental temperature. I don't have to blow. I am much more likable when I'm stable. Oh. If so, I'm an emotional roller coaster, or if you never know when, when I'm going to drop the bomb and be in a bad mood, that's not very likable. Right. And I wish that everybody in the world would think about that, because you'd never need therapy. Ah, uh, no kidding. If we hit self-regulation. Yeah, right. We could be more calm. We could be more self-controlled, self-contained. It's all right if you didn't do that. Doesn't bother me. Yeah. I don't have to get angry because you did this 
or you did that, you know, or the house isn't perfect. It's my issue. Oh, right. You know? Right. But I, I just think emotional self, I think you have it. I think you have Thank it. Thank you. I've worked at it. Well, I, I think we've all worked I've at it. I've worked at it. You know, I used, to, I used to say to when I was screaming all the time in my younger years, I just scream because I'm an Arab. <laughs> and that was your... Well, yeah, and a, and, a, and a good friend of mine finally said to me, you know, Nikki, you don't have to scream. I thought, well, I, it's in my DNA. No, I don't think it is. <laughs> so I've kind of stopped screaming. And we'll say to people, I don't, you can't scream in here. Yeah, I don't it, want screaming in my office. Yeah. We'll go out to the woods if you need to beat the tree. <laughs> So likability is in our control. Likability is in our control. And let's all work at being more likable. Uh, it doesn't mean we're looking for approval. Right. It just means we're likable. People we're, like to be around like people. Yes, yes, yes. And and the world will be a better place. We're a better place. And on that note, Dr. And Nick, on that note. I thank you. We're likable. Have a beautiful Sunday. We're likable. <laughs> 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 More of Weekends with Whitney after this. <laughs> Atlas Foundation Repair. Fixing your foundation problems for more than 30 years while preserving and protecting your trees. Thanks for sharing your time with us here on Weekends with Whitney. We hope to see you back here again next week. We leave you with 60 seconds of mindfulness brought to you by Hemingbow in the beautiful Felicianas.